This video will explain how to safely manage an airway and ventilate a patient using the following adjuncts. Goodell oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway and bag valve mask. Adjuncts are required when the patient cannot protect their own airway. The danger being the tongue falling back to displace the epiglottis and obstruct the passage of air in and out of the lungs. This most commonly occurs in unconscious patients as muscle tone is lost and the gag reflex is absent. In the following scenarios, the patient is in varying degrees of consciousness and is not adequately ventilating. Basic airway manoeuvres such as chin lift and jaw thrust have failed. An oropharyngeal airway is indicated only for unconscious patients because inserting this type of airway when the gag reflex is intact might lead to vomiting and aspiration. First, open the mouth and inspect to assess whether an oropharyngeal airway is viable. Use suction if required. The Goodell is a hollow tube with a tip at one end and a flange at the other. The body is semicircular in shape to follow the curvature of the palate. The correct sizing of the Goodell is important both for safety and to maximise its efficacy. The Goodell is sized from the incisors of the mouth to the tragus of the ear. Approach the patient's head from behind the bed. Open the mouth and insert the Goodell upside down with the tip pointing upwards. When you feel the tip touching the back of the throat, rotate the Goodell 180 degrees to leave it in the correct position. Inserting the Goodell upside down like this may feel counterintuitive, but is done this way as the inverted curved body presses the tongue down to stop it falling back and obstructing the airway. In children, however, the Goodell is inserted the right way up to avoid trauma to soft tissues. If the patient starts to gag upon insertion, remove the Goodell and check the size is correct, then re-attempt insertion. If it is still not possible, consider abandoning the procedure and returning to manual airway manoeuvres. Once in situ, the Goodell should remain there of its own accord. Do not secure it with tape in case the patient starts to gag or cough, in which case they may aspirate because they cannot expel the device. Nasopharyngeal airway adjuncts are indicated in unconscious patients. Unlike the Goodell though, they have use in semi-conscious because they are less likely to stimulate the gag reflex. They may also be used in patients who do not require assistance with ventilation, but in whom you still wish to maximise the airway patency. In some situations, such as if the patient has trismus, or maxillofacial injuries present, nasopharyngeal airways may be the only way to establish a patent airway. First check that the nasal passages are viable. If there is any indication of basal skull fracture, then do not attempt a nasopharyngeal airway due to the risk of inserting it through a possible cribriform plate fracture and injuring the brain. The nasopharyngeal airway has a beveled tip and flange end. Sizing of the nasopharyngeal airway is again important. Correct sizing can be ascertained by matching the diameter of the nasopharyngeal airway to the diameter of the patient's little finger. As a rough estimate, the airway size selected should also correspond to the distance between the patient's nostril and the meatus of the ear. Before insertion, apply a water-based lubricating gel onto the nasopharyngeal adjunct. Approach the patient's head from behind the bed. With the beveled end, insert the airway through the most patent nostril. Push posteriorly so that the airway moves backwards along the horizontal floor of the hard palate and not upwards into the cribriform plate. A slight twisting motion may help push the airway in. Keep going until the flange end is at the nostril. This means the airway is into the posterior pharynx. If there is too much resistance, pull out and try the other nostril. Once in place, the flange will stop inhalation, but tape may be used to secure. Both nostrils can have a nasopharyngeal airway inserted to further increase the patency of the airway. The bag valve mask allows positive airway pressure to be applied to any patient that is not ventilating properly. 
Most obviously, this may be if they are apneic, but also if their respiratory rate is too slow or too fast to provide an adequate tidal volume. The device consists of three parts. The bag is a self-inflating air chamber and can be fitted to an oxygen reservoir to supply supplementary oxygen to the patient. The bag is connected by a tube to an oxygen flow meter at the wall or to a cylinder. The valve acts one way, allowing air from the bag to flow into the patient's lungs, preventing deoxygenated air returning to the bag in expiration. The mask delivers air to the airway by forming a tight seal around the patient's nose and mouth. Correct sizing is critical to ensure this seal and should be done by placing the mask over the patient's nose and mouth so that they are covered. The mask is too big if it extends over the chin. Ventilation with the bag valve mask is only effective if there is a patent airway. So first check the airway and use adjuncts if necessary. Application of the bag valve mask is always a two-person technique, with one person controlling the mask and the other person controlling the bag. The first clinician should approach the patient's head from behind the bed and place the mask over the patient's nose and mouth. Two opposing C-shapes should be formed by the thumb and index fingers and downward pressure applied to form a tight seal. Wrap the remaining fingers around the jaw and pull upwards to help open the airway further. Avoid putting too much downward pressure on the mask as you may inadvertently flex the head forward and reduce the size of the airway. An alternative grip is to apply downward pressure on the mask with just the thumbs, using the thenar eminences to stabilize the mask in place and the fingers to pull the jaw upwards. The second clinician should squeeze the bag fully every five seconds to achieve a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute. If the bag valve mask ventilation is successful, breath mist should appear on the mask and the chest will be seen to rise as the bag is squeezed. Patient monitoring equipment will show a decrease in the end tidal CO2 and an improvement in the oxygen saturations. The commonest reason for failure of bag valve ventilation is a poor seal between the airway and the mask. If signs of ventilation are not seen, reevaluate the seal.